I just want to say I'm very honored to be included in this uh, in this wonderful uh, day where we get to be with so many global health champions. So thank you very much. I am the Associate Dean for Global Health uh, here at the Cummings School of Medicine. And my job is to create an enabling environment uh, and an ethical environment for global health work here at the Cummings School. And today I want to talk specifically about global health research. I was really interested to be listening to the previous uh, speakers and, and the ways in which uh, partnership has been talked about in the programs and in the, the enormous undertakings that so many people are engaged in. And certainly I heard the word hard. It is hard sometimes uh, to do partnerships and there are so many different individuals who are involved. I want to introduce the Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research as a resource to any of you who are uh, engaged in this area. Uh, the CCGHR has been engaged in working towards better distribution, production and use and sharing of knowledge. And the members are focused on global health research as a way to fundamentally address global health challenges. We create a, a large number of resources that you can use as educators and I'm going to be drawing uh, in this presentation on a lot of the material uh, that comes from the coalition. We also have a partnership with CUGH, uh, our American counterpart there in, in, uh, in the States and, and we are working closely with them. Uh, just to let you know that the, many of these resources are openly available to you and to your students. I want to set a context for the kind of work that we do here at the Cummings School to pre pre uh, prepare our faculty and our students. And the question that we ask ourselves really is what are the skills and capacities that individuals need to do excellent global health research? And we've adapted many of the CCGHR um, information into what we call a core set of competencies. It's interesting that these competencies tend to increase in number as time goes on. Um, but I want to just to uh, give you a sense that in addition to all of those vital clinical skills and, and uh, skills that you need in terms of your technical knowledge, uh, whether that's also in the area of, say, medical education, um, basic research skills, we need to have a set of core competencies that inform how we engage globally. Certainly the ability to uh, understand the unique and particular complexities of the knowledge translation process uh, when we're engaged with multiple stakeholders and multiple governments, multiple layers of governments, policy makers. Um, knowledge translation within a global health context is complicated. It's complicated at home, but it, there's an increasing level of complication when we're working uh, internationally. Certainly the notion of capacity building, trying to really uh, expand on that notion and have it uh, be viewed not as a one-way street but as a mutual shared capacity building with our partners and I think this is a shift that I'm going to talk a little bit more about as I go on um, but that the research uh, practice has at its core and within the negotiation how we are going to be building our mutual capacity throughout each of the partner orientations a knowledge around equity and the social determinants, certainly around the unique challenges involved in ethics in doing research globally, a solid basis in cultural competency and what that means and how to engage across different cultural domains, and of course, equitable partnerships, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today. We might consider this a primary set of knowledge areas that form a foundation uh, for our faculty and our trainees um, as they go out and begin their global health journey. 
just some language that I want to touch on as I'm going through. Uh, I've already heard people talk about the global north and south, and I think you will see some of that language reflected. Uh, low and middle income countries uh, is another terminology that's often used. And I wanted to define partnerships from a global health research perspective um, as a strategy that contributes to achieving equity in health. And this is how we position ourselves uh, as we talk about partnerships uh, at the coming school, but also at the coalition. And you'll hear a lot of that languaging around um, partnerships as a way to promote col collective and cooperative research. So global health research, as I'm going to be discussing it, refers to the study of problems that have a disproportionate he uh, health burden in low and middle income countries. And, and global health research recognizes that knowledge is a key driver of health. And it aims uh, to address how we can use evidence that we already have so that we do not waste additional health uh, research resources, but also plan and generate the new knowledge uh, and evidence that we need for good decision making. I have a dear friend in Africa who often says to me, I work in Tanzania a great deal in Ethiopia, he says, Jennifer, we need very little new research. What we need is we need to use what we already know. I want to also mention the IDRC, which is the um, Inter Council International Development Research Council here in Canada that funded the research on global health partnerships that I'm going to be talking about. The IDRC saw this as an investment um, and we, I will talk about the, the actual research um, in a moment, but we learned a huge amount by building on the, the knowledge of others, particularly uh, the work by the Swiss on the Swiss principles for global health research partnerships. And the outcome of this particular research project was the partnership assessment tool. And I'm going to discuss that as well. If you are interested in the scholarship in this area, a lot of this is uh, available to you through the Canadian Coalition website. This uh, research project um, that led to the partnership assessment tool was carried out with over 200 researchers from more than 15 countries around the world. We had a Latin America consultation which included uh, countries from the Andean region. We had a South Asia consultation including countries uh, from around South Asia um, including Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, uh, Afghanistan. And we had an Africa consultation which brought in six uh, countries from uh, North and East uh, and Central Africa. So this was a, a time where we went uh, to all of our constituencies uh, and talked to partners about their impressions and uh, experiences of North-South partnerships. So just before I begin, I'd like to dip a little bit into some of the research that uh, we did prior to this consultation and just touch on some of the models that exist historically for global health research. I think really, um, I like the notion that we should be optimistic and that we should recognize that we've made huge gains. But I think we also have to be realistic about the fact that there is a long history of partnerships which have not been equitable. One of the ones that I think uh, we all may be familiar with is the notion of the safari model or the parachute model, sometimes also known as the briefcase model, uh, where a northern partner arrives um, into a setting uh, and with a research program already designed with all of the plans for the data created and with the intention of gathering the samples or the data and returning to their uh, office or university to write it up and publish it. Oops. Um, can you still see me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, 
I just uh, hit the wrong button there. I'm back again. <clears throat> the other model, uh, another few models I just want to talk about is we're uh, setting the historical context for global health partnerships is the model that really believes in a deficit versus mutual benefit model. In many ways, historically, we've come at our global health research partnerships presuming a deficiency in knowledge, people, or capacity in our partners. And I think that, uh, as I said in my blog post, um, during my consultations around the world, I was often confronted with this, where uh, my southern partners would say, really and truly, this deficit model is really uh, a way in which great gaps and distances are created between us. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay, good. I keep having these blips that make me sound like I'm, uh, I'm being cut off. Um, and what you need to realize as, as Northern partners is that we have enormous capacity in the South. Our human resources are outstanding. Our motivation is huge. We may lack sometimes in the financial resources, but it is incorrect to approach us with a deficit model. And we would much rather be uh, engaged in negotiations around mutual benefit. The South-North model is an emerging one where uh, there is interest in the South and there is an approach to the North to, um, to engage in a partnership. And there's an attempt uh, through these models um, to have a different sort of format. One of them is, a, again, a more uh, semi-colonial model with annexed sites where governments invite foreign institutions to come and set up a site managed by expatriates. And there are a lot of challenges and benefits associated with that model. There's certainly a lot of employment that can come to local researchers. However, there's also that uh, concern around um, pulling away researchers into those establishments where the pay is high. So there's often a need for some really nuanced analysis of these uh, arrangements. The South-South uh, South, South model is one that is really gaining in, in uh, momentum as our Southern partners um, develop many of the health uh, research infrastructures that are needed. Um, they are reaching out to each other. Um, I think East Africa is a great example where uh, there are South-South partnerships and where the Northern partner may simply pay a facilitation role or may be one of the uh, less powerful uh, partners. There's also the mega coalition model, um, which I think is, is a one in which we've seen huge traction with uh, the malaria initiatives and initiatives around HIV. And although I don't have time to go into all of the various strengths and weaknesses uh, inherent in those mega coalition models, uh, if you do have an interest, there is quite a lot of critical literature around it and also um, literature that tries to describe how indeed these are uh, strengthening uh, health research systems within given countries. So, as I said, if we think about partnerships as a mechanism or a strategy, um, I just wanted to return to a, uh, this notion um, that it really favors cooperation above substitution, support, subordination, or competition. And what do we really mean by partnership for global health research? What we want to be thinking about is how do we create the supportive relationships and the sustainability that will strengthen institutions, organizations, and social entities, including the ones in the North, so that we can better and in a more enlightened way engage. Again, these partnerships are based on equity and shared responsibility, and they recognize diversity and the diversity of interests of the different groups that are coming together. And uh, again, mentioning this notion of uh, governance that we brought up in our first talk, that as we think about a global health research partnership, the governance component is absolutely critical. 
And I'm going to be talking about how that can be created as we go a little bit more through the partnership assessment tool and some of the conversations that need to occur in order that the governance structure is created in a uh, supportive and sustainable and equitable way. From a philosophical point of view, um, we look wherever possible for global health research partnerships to favor um, autonomy, to expand networks and share networks, and to, as I said, strengthen governance. So these are notions, these are the meta notions that uh, inform our, our movement in this area. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the development of the partnership assessment tool. I mentioned that uh, this was the result of consultations with our partners around the world. In our first consultation in Latin America, we heard a lot of stories of how our partners had experienced um, some of the more safari models that I mentioned um, and how they felt that the notion of uh, building local uh, health research capacity either nationally or at the institution level or even within the NGOs is absent from the way in which uh, both finances were uh, handled, uh, the way that intellectual property was negotiated and so on. As we moved to South Asia, we had this uh, very strong echoing of these themes and the great challenge that we faced through this process was a constant identification of the problems, but a lack of clarity around the solutions and how practically to address them. We had to move beyond the notion of a checklist um, that we could say, yes, we, you know, we have uh, some ideas around equity, check. Um, we have talked to stakeholders, check. Um, our partners in uh, South Asia said that this was insufficient, that the main reason why it was insufficient was that our, South, our Southern partners did not have a position of strength upon which to negotiate what they thought was important. I think that this is probably the heart and the nub of the purpose uh, of the partnership assessment tool. We learned that the power differentials were so significant between our uh, colleagues, experienced by our colleagues in the Global South, and therefore they needed to be able to have a set of questions and conversations uh, with their colleagues to establish the parameters, the governance structure, and the more equitable arrangements. And Many of them, and certainly many of us, didn't know exactly how to frame those conversations or how they might be held. When we went to Africa, we were in Ethiopia. We brought together uh, over 60 researchers from all over Africa. And we sat down and began to outline the conversations that would need to be held. And what came out was that a partnership for global health research often has a very energetic inception phase. There's a lot of momentum and interest and good feeling. But this inception phase is absolutely critical and is often only used for the design of the project itself and is rarely devoted to the creation of the partnership and the nurturing of the partnership as something that is in many ways separate from the project itself. So our colleagues suggested that we create an inception phase that included the development of a partnership agreement. And as you will see when you look at the PAT, which um, you'll find online at the coalition, the, partner, the inception phase is all about addressing these questions but you can do it in a variety of ways. You can use this as a sit down meeting with your partners. You can each do it remotely uh, and fill in a variety of the uh, questions and then sit down and negotiate the, the territory. The second phase is the implementation phase and there are very unique challenges in the implementation phase about how you're going to resolve conflicts, how you're going to manage money, how you're going to deal with uh, unexpected 
um, issues such as uh, the loss of a partner or uh, the changes in the partnership arrangement. The dissemination phase, I think, is one of the most critical uh, of any partnership because this really looks at how knowledge is going to be translated and who has to be at the table uh, for the evidence that's been created during the research uh, to be used by the research users. And finally, our partners said they would really like to have a set of conversations to end a project well. They had experienced so many projects that had ended badly, um, without good will or without uh, a good sense of an evaluation of how the partnership itself had been conducted. So the next phase of the partnership assessment tool includes the conversations to have good endings uh, so that you're prepared, hopefully, to partner again in the future. I'm just going to take about two minutes to give you an example of how we use the partnership assessment tool to negotiate a partnership in Tanzania with uh, our, our wonderful 10-year partners now, um, Catholic University of Allied Health Sciences in Mwanza. We, uh, I'm, and I'll just touch on the inception phase. I remember sitting with my, my colleagues around the table and bringing out the questions that had been in the tool uh, about the inception phase to negotiate what roles were going to be taken on by whom and how we were going to share the and develop a governance structure. And my colleagues turned to me and, and in, in all honesty said, we have never engaged in a conversation like this before and we have been partners many, many times. Usually the governance structure or the way in which the partnership is going to unfold is presented to us, not negotiated with us. This was 10 years ago. And we've had many of the challenges I'm sure that you have had. Um, but I have to say that as we've gone through our partnership, we've been able to use the tool and the questions and conversations and have on an annual basis a nurturing of the partnership and a way in which to mitigate some of the immense challenges you have during research. So we want to deal with real world problems as we work through our partnership. We want to know the challenges uh, of, of everyone. They include things like who's going to author pub publications? How are operating funds going to be managed? How are we going to design a capacity strengthening initiative that means that we create more out of the research partnership than just the um, focus on the research itself? What kind of capacity building initiatives are going to be created? And how can we take from uh, our own individual project a more high level view of the health research system within uh, a given country and ask how that could be strengthened as well. The question that guides us always is, is the work uh, that we're doing promoting the well-being of my partner? And that's from the perception of all partners. So um, intentionality, conscious intentionality uh, around supporting the development of scholarship amongst our partners uh, is really, uh, I cannot uh, emphasize this enough, this was a message that we received across the globe that really one of the partnership goals should be the strengthening of scholarship and the support of our colleagues um, in both uh, having access to opportunities to learn how to write grants more effectively, how to participate in the manuscript preparation, and to be well uh, acknowledged for the work that they do. So what I'd like to um, say that as we begin to wrap up my, my comments is that we can have these conversations and use the partnership assessment tool not only for research partnerships, but also to help us with program development. Um, these negotiations can be effective uh, whether or not you're doing uh, research or whether you're coming in to do an evaluation or whether you're actually going to uh, be preparing a new program. 
So the partnership assessment tool uh, helps to develop, monitor, and evaluate the partnership over time. And the notion being that the uh, way in which we are brought together throughout the life of the partnership can really lead us to a level of sustainability and future planning. We have a choice as researchers from anywhere in the world. And we want to do our best to take the road that enables a greater negotiation and a more equitable research partnerships. As we heard from our early speakers, the challenges are great and the constraints are real. But I ask you to consider the philosophical commitment and to build on what I know is a profound respect that you have for the people that you work with around the world. We don't want to return to or support some of the more historical ways that we've seen uh, of developing research partnerships. And we want to also create something that is even greater than the project that we're engaged in. So in conclusion, um, we want to focus on transparency in the partnership. And this is related to that governance structure and also the fiscal aspects of the project. And we want to be sure that we're constantly developing trust and deciding on objectives together. Negotiating priorities and again thinking beyond the current project to the mutual capacity building not only in our partner institution in the south but in our own and I have to say truly that the part that the capacity that's been built at the coming school in terms of our knowledge um, of how to engage and how to prepare our students effectively on all of those areas of cultural competency um, we have gained far, far, far more uh, in, in our capacity than I believe our partners have. Our next level. So um, relevance. I think uh, the partnership assessment tool is really seeking to uh, ensure that the research has relevance to um, those with whom we are working and that the research partnership is also constantly thinking about knowledge translation and linking our colleagues around the world through networks. So uh, generosity of sharing, and we're really seeing this now in Tanzania as we're beginning to really link more closely with East African networks for global health research. Just to, to, to re-emphasize that the inception phase is often where the energy goes and it's often where the partnerships have the first bloom. It's like the honeymoon and the exciting time. But we really have to focus on all aspects and the whole life of the partnership. And someone in the project, we have found it's really important to nominate one or two key leaders who are going to be responsible for the partnership nurturing. And this is above and beyond the products of the research agenda. Next. So what I hope you've experienced through my conversation with you today and, and uh, through this remarkable uh, day that, that, that Jill and the Einstein School has set up is that we're really involved in a call to action on a more equitable global health uh, research partnership model. And I want to thank you all very much uh, for being with me today. Questions? I think we have time for a couple of questions. Oh. That was a great presentation, thank you, and applies to all kinds of partnerships. Could I ask how you've managed ultimately who makes the decision? And uh, I've, I've handled it by having alternate groups take turns chairing because that sets the agenda. That's one way of bringing equity to it. But are there other strategies that you've been able to use to? to manage the interface about who's making the final decision? I think that's just such a great question. And um, I would say that uh, before I say, I'll try and say how. So I think the partnership assessment tool has enabled us to um, sometimes canvas the the ideas and the thoughts of our partners um, when they're not sitting in front of us. 
So what we heard from our colleagues was that sometimes these negotiations are very difficult and they are, uh, our partners have not been trained in how to negotiate. And, uh, and so one of the ways in which we've gotten to some of the um, clarity around what people really want is that we've asked people to um, fill out several of the questions on the tool prior to coming to the meeting. So we are more likely to get, in many ways, the sort of honest uh, view of how something uh, ought to unfold. And um, so that's been a facilitative mechanism. Uh, the, the other way is, I, I think, uh, to build capacity together around this issue. So put that one right on the table. How are we going to decide how are we going to work through who gets to decide? And I mean, you and I both know there's probably a hundred decisions in every negotiation. And uh, around the fiscal management, it's probably the most difficult. Who's, where's the money going to come from? How's the transparency? How's the money going to move? Who's going to have access? Who's going to have signing rights on, on signing off on money? Um, each and every partnership and each and every project is different because often we're guided by, by, the, by the donor about what we can and cannot do. So what I found is where, where there is no wiggle room and it says, you know, the northern partner has to sign off on everything and that's the decision, um, how can we now mitigate against the lack of influence or power that the partner in the South feels when it's been set up that way, and that's the negotiation. So I'm not sure if that helps, but I think we're always looking for mitigation where decisions are almost already made and uh, opportunities to recognize that negotiation skills are not necessarily top of mind and they are, are needing to be built, but we can look at other ways to get at the information prior to sitting down face to face. I thank you very much for discussing a very valuable tool. I have a question. I'm Deb Olson from University of Minnesota. And we heard from our earlier speaker, our keynote, that one of the areas that she found um, of importance as we look to global health work is giving an MBA, is the statement she made. Then I looked at your set of competencies and I didn't see the competencies around program management, um, which I would equate management skills with an MBA. The third piece is then I just heard you say that financial issues around financial management is oftentimes an ingredient that gets in the way of true partnership. What do we need to do from your perspective and the assessments that you have done with this effective tool to take those types of skills and program management forward in a way that is both equitable and understandable across the north-south boundaries. You know, this is this is just such a a critical piece. We've we've just started to partner with our school of business um, to bring them in to what we have as a global graduate leaders program. Uh, we, I personally, and those uh, emerging leaders who I work with around the world, have said that this is a gap, and it's not a gap that medical schools can fill. It's really a, a gap that our colleagues uh, from the business school can do. So, over the next year, we're planning to create a leadership development program um, for many of us in this role. A lot of us have the project management side of things that we get because we have to create grants for our, our, our government agencies. USAID will have a whole project management flow and logic models and all of that. And um, uh, But I think that the business school really are the, is the, the place where we're going to find the, the strengths in those areas that we need. And so we've identified it as a capacity gap. 
and the leadership program uh, is going to have several modules on project management, um, uh, economics, uh, health economics, and uh, we're going to create uh, that training um, opportunity for those in medicine who would like it. But in short course, I think we do need the MBAs, but there's also a need for uh, some of more of an infusion so you can speak the language of, of those who may be taking the lead in some of these uh, more business areas. So I agree, my, my competencies wheel, I, when I sat down a few weeks ago, we, we identified about three or four other competencies we want in there, but um, we also realized that we can't do it all. So I think the business folks are going to come and help us. Okay, I think um, we need to move on. We'll have more questions later. Thank you so much.